So I have a story, as always, and it's a rare occasion that I get to share this story. So hopefully, I want to start by saying this. Is there anyone here from South Carolina? Okay, so for eight years, I worked in the State House. And for those of you from South Carolina, you already know this story, hopefully. If not, then I want to share it anyway. During the Civil War, uh, South Carolina was under construction for its third State House, which is the current State House in Columbia. The second one was a one-story wooden structure really on the northwest corner of the State House. It was a wooden structure, and it was in operation during the Civil War when we seceded. The construction of the second or the third state house stopped during the civil war and it's a lovely building it's got you know gray uh, granite on the outside gray granite on the outside that was shipped in from lancaster county a little further north and a little further uh, east of where columbia is and so during the civil war just as general sherman was marching into columbia what they wanted to do was clear out the center of the town before they could move in so the Congaree River, which is about a, a quarter mile away from the State House on the western side, was where they laid cannons. And they fired empty cannonballs. Now, the State House didn't have a roof on it at the time. And as it happens, most of the cannonballs ended up landing inside the State House. Now, six of, six of the cannonballs that were fired hit the exterior structure. Four on the west side, two on the south side. And they did damage not structural damage but just damage so it chipped the stone where it hit the, the the side of the building and in a couple of places you can actually see the imprint of where the cannonball is so when they started construction of the state house again and this was 1880 so they suspended construction for 20 years when they started construction again the debate started about what were we going to do with the damage that was done by the cannonballs fired by the yankee invaders and so the answer was we're going to mark them and so on the side of the building, there are four on the west side where the four cannonballs hit bronze stars to signify that's where the Union hit the side of the building and two on the south side. Now there's one that is just about eye level to someone my height. And what is really interesting is in the eight years that I was there, fifth graders are required to come to the state house and take the tour. Part of the tour is counting off the stars. And so outside of my office, at least four times a day during the school year, you could hear kids go, and in unison, one, two, three, and they're counting them off. Now, the one that's eye level, the kids would all want to get their picture taken with it, so they would stand up next to it. Over the years, some industrious kids have managed to knock the star loose, so you could actually hear it spinning. And that my desk was on the exact opposite side of that. So you got to imagine, this is what I listened to every day while I was at work, children shouting out numbers and then turning the star while they got their picture taken. But I tell that story because it, 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 what they decided, what South Carolina decided was they wanted to mark the occasion. They didn't want to forget about it. They didn't want to cover it up and they didn't want to fix it. What they wanted to do was mark the occasion because it was part of the history of the state and that it has a very rich history. And for those of you from South Carolina, you've probably heard lots of it. But, you know, the idea here with what we're doing today is the exact same thing. We're marking history. We have a sacred duty as collectors. We're really preserving a piece of history that most people don't ever talk about because we're not talking about famous people. We're talking about everyday people. And the history we're preserving is the history of us. And so that includes this period between 1861 and 1865 that happened during the Civil War. And so as we've moved along in time, we know that, that issues in the Confederacy are controversial. And the more controversial something is, I say this as a history major from the University of Maryland, as things get more controversial, you've got to work harder and fight harder to keep them in the present. Because we do always have to remember these things that happened to us because they're part of defining where we are today. And so I think it's been particularly unique. One, not because Trish paid a lot of money. Where is she? There she is. Not because she paid a lot of money, but because of what's going to be inside that and what it reflects. And for the hobby, when I got here, I learned very quickly that there are a lot of different specialties out there, and they all have their own group. Now, my mantra has always been, look, I don't care what you collect. I care that you collect. And so my objective is really to make sure that there's never a wrong door into the hobby. And so, one, we're going to have a remarkable collection of information and research from one of the most profound uh, Civil War historians that I think exists on the planet. 
And, and that unique treasure is going to be here. And with it is going to be a room that uh, has blue and gray in it and will mark the, the collection that we have here and remind people every day that we are preserving a very important part of history and that there really is no wrong door here. Trish, I can't thank you enough for your faith in us and for your contribution for that and for what it's going to reflect for generations to come. And that's incredibly meaningful. And so as we continue to build out the APC, being able to warehouse this information, this knowledge, and make sure that no one ever forgets what happened is going to continue to be a critical mission for us. So Trish, thank you very much for that. So now that you've heard enough from me, I want to introduce some people who've known Trish for a very long time, not too long, but for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, I'd like to introduce someone who just recently was recognized by the APS with the Luff Award, which is the most prestigious, I believe, award you can receive in the hobby. And I can't think of someone who was more deserving for two reasons. Number one, he gave the best speech at the Luff Award dinner because it was brief. Uh, and I expect he'll deliver the same here. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Lara. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I. Uh, X'd out about five lines for my speech because Scott already said it, so uh, I'll man, shorter speech here. Anyways, I've known Trish, Trish since about 1990 when I joined the Confederate Stamp Alliance, and I was uh, writing an article on the NIDER and Mining Bureau, and Peter Paul said, if you want to know something about it, talk to Trish. She knows everything about the Civil War, and that's how we met. And then at the Smithsonian Postal Museum, I was the research chair there, and Trish was on the research council, and she helped expedite the uh, Gross Gallery when she was there, which is a huge accomplishment. She's won num numerous awards, philatelic awards, research awards. She's a fellow of the Royal Society. She's uh, just recently got her 50-year pin with the Confederate Stamp Alliance. 50 years a member with the Confederate Stamp Alliance. That's a great accomplishment. Uh, if you look at articles where she's helped people write, uh, give, giving them information, I bet that you'll find her name in over 600 articles in the acknowledgments. Anybody that asks her a question, they acknowledge her help in, in making that article or the book a uh, happening. I'm honored to be her friend, and I hope everyone enjoys the Civil Wars exhibition and symposium this weekend. Thank you. When we were getting ready for this, uh, I was told that he was still much older than her then, but uh, one of her longest serving friends, I think, is uh, Skylar Rumsey, who is, of course, the proprietor of Skylar Rumsey Auctions. I guess I should put an advertisement into the introduction. But ladies and gentlemen, Skylar Rumsey. Good evening, everybody. Um, First of all, this is my first trip here to the APS, and I'm just blown away about how awesome it is, how wonderful, and congratulations to, to Scott and everybody here at the APS. We all are members, and most of us life members, so kudos to you guys. It's really fantastic. Um, I've known Trish. Normally, I would say I've known Trish longer than everybody in this room, but that doesn't work with this crowd. But I've known Trish longer than my wife, so it does count for something, you know. That's another story. But uh, anyway, I went to work for John and Trish Kaufman in uh, 1977. I was a young kid, didn't know anything about philately, and John and Trish were running around, and, and as far as I could tell, Kaufman, both John and Trish were the center of Confederate philately at that time, it seemed like. Trish was writing up lots. Trish was doing articles for the CSA. They were conferring back and forth. We'd have an auction, and every Confederate collector would show up. And it was really the hub at that time, it seemed like to me, of Confederate philately. And I think that that's a great honor to both John and Trish and to have them honored in this way, to have the Kaufman uh, Civil War Room is really a great thing, and I congratulate you, Trish. It's been a lot of great years. What can I say about the next speaker that all of you don't already know? She has been a friend. She has been a 
uh, a sounding board. She has been sanity and sometimes in the storm. And I have been eternally grateful for all that she's given to me. She does it quietly, respectfully, but forcefully. And I really do appreciate all that she's done for me. And, you know, the, the room will forever enshrine, I think, what Trish has meant to the hobby at large. And so without further ado, the lady of the hour, Trish Kaufman. Thank you all for the uh, kind words and fond memories, truly. Uh, I can't think of a more appropriate event to dedicate this room. Uh, and I'm thrilled that the APS and the CSA have come together to put on this Civil War event. It's uh, fantastic. I'm looking forward to the next few fantastic days. But it would have been even more special if John Kaufman were here, for if John was here, uh, obviously, uh, without John, there would be no Trish Kaufman. Although I've been remarried for 27 years, which a lot of people don't even realize, um, I'm proud to carry on the Kaufman name in philately forever. Uh, this year, as Tom mentioned, is my 50th year uh, in the CSA, but also in the APS. And I joined both organizations in 1969. And that just happens to be the same year that I met John Kaufman. I met him at Nojex when I was recruiting for the CSA. So I signed him up in membership for the CSA. He'd been a member uh, in 1965, but he had let his membership lapse. And when he did, uh, he looked for the CSA again, couldn't find him, and found me and him uh, at, the, uh, at Nojex. Uh, he was reinstated in 1970, and um, that was the same year that I became editor of the Confederate Philatelist, which I did for 17 and a half years. There's another 17 and a half year person wandering around here, too. Uh, CP became a large part of my life, and actually still is. Uh, in 1971, John began his philatelic career. He'd been a childhood collector. His father helped mentor him. His brother, many of you know, was also in uh, public auction business, uh, but was more of a specialist in locals and carriers. John loved Confederate postal history, and so did I. Together, um, it was amazing the following year after John began his philatelic career with five specialized sales. The first one was all of one mimeographed page offered 38 lots of U.S. and Confederates. Uh, so a, a tiny beginning, but uh, with a much larger ending. The first offering offered only 38 lots, as I said. But that was followed the following year by his first public auctions, which were in New York City, which was the city of his birth. He realized pretty quickly that he was up against some big guns in New York City and decided he needed to have his own city. And he called me up and said, are you amenable to joining me? If I moved to Washington, DC, would you come work for me? And I hadn't done anything professionally in Philately at that time. And I said, sure, it was a paycheck. <laughs> but uh, became much more, obviously. It's become my lifetime passion. So within the month of me joining John in Washington, I signed him up for another society, and that was the American Philatelic Society. So I ended up sp proposing him for membership to both of these great organizations that come together here this week. Together, we incorporated a public auction firm, which um, was under the name of John W. Kaufman Incorporated, because after all, it was a man's world. So we went by John W. Kaufman Incorporated, because there was a Robert A. Siegel Incorporated and H.R. Harmer, and there weren't any women. And that was perceived, I was told, not by John, as a mom and pop sort of thing. If it had been Kaufman Auctions, that wouldn't have been a good idea. So <laughs> John W. Kaufman it was. <clears throat> but we were there uh, for a long time, until 1988, when he died on his 47th birthday of a sudden brain aneurysm. I carried on for another nine months after that, uh, continued with four public auctions and two capital mail bid sales 
In all, we had 142 auctions and 11 capital mail bid sales, which handled the less expensive material. We did everything from U.S. to foreign, like all public auctions do, but our real specialty, what we were known for, was Confederates and U.S. as well. Uh, those who know me um, know that I moved on to a partnership for a while with a British dealer who dealt in worldwide collections, and that just was not me. I was not into worldwide, still am not. Um, so I moved on and began um, retail business specializing solely in Confederate stamps and postal history. Those who know me from my writing know that uh, I hit a lot of different things, but a lot perceive me just as a writer of history and social aspects uh, that are linked to covers, but there is a lot more as members of the CSA know. Most of my serious research material goes into the Confederate philatelists because the, those are the people who really understand what I'm writing about. No, no use putting those in a general publication. So I am thrilled to be able to share this. Um, sharing my philatelic passion through research and writing is a huge part of who I am. The philatelic community really is blessed with such a position as this in the American Philatelic Center. How lucky are we? I mean, this is a fantastic facility. We have a fantastic staff and volunteers who are dedicated, enthusiastic, and uh, it, it's a wonder. So I'm very grateful that Philately has such a place and that the hard work of prior generations is shared with new students. And I'm delighted that my research will be here. Most of it will not be here until I pass on to the great stamp club in the sky. <laughs> sky? <laughs> You know, aside from the room now, John Kaufman has another connection to the APS that I'd like to share, and that is, you know, we have these four inverted Jennies that were stolen from our show in 1955, and when one of them was recovered uh, in the uh, the 70s, we or the late 70s, we, we got it in 81. Uh, we got a second one in 1982, which we then sold at our stamp show, now the Great American Stamp Show, by the way, uh, in St. Louis and fetched a pretty decent price for it. So uh, as luck would have it, his legacy is really embedded in our history in a way that very few people can be. So we're grateful for that. Uh, Trish reminds me, I'm supposed to tell you, she also recruited me to the, the CSA. So I've been a member now for what, two years, three, like two, almost two and a half years. And I've been thankful to be a part of the community and thank you all very much for being here. Now the important thing that Dean tells me I'm supposed to say, drinks are on him. <laughs> we're doing a reception one of the great things about our complex is we have a distillery over there and so we're going to be doing a reception over there now dean's got drink tickets he's not paying for all of them just a couple of them and uh, and he will be able to hand those out to you so that you can enjoy some of central pennsylvania's finest liquor oh yes thank you I don't know where David is, but right a special thanks to Kelleher, of course. Yeah, there's David right there. To Kelleher for being the sponsor of the uh, the reception tonight. So actually, drinks are on David. 